The views and opinions expressed in today's blah, blah. the views and opinions expressed by today's guests are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily reflect those of the Walt Disney Company. Hello and welcome to the Emperor's New Podcast, where we explore every corner of the Emperor's New Groove universe. I am your host, Micah Hirsch. Joining me today are my co-hosts, Shelby Sessler and Jacob Martin. Hello. Hey. And today, we're once again expanding to the greater Disneyverse with our very special guests. They're di the directors of the iconic 100th anniversary short, Once Upon a Studio. Please welcome Dan Abraham and Trent Corey. Hey, everybody. Hello. 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 Hiya. So, so good to be here. Yeah. Um, now, I already know I'm going to go ahead and ask my question, and then I'll let my co-hosts ask their questions and back and forth. I already know about this because I'm a nerd, so I did research. Um, but for our listeners who might be curious, how did uh, the short come into being? <laughs> yeah, the short has kind of an interesting uh, origin story. I'll say we, uh, Dan and I, we met back in 2019 during the making of Frozen 2. That's kind of where this all started, believe it or not. And and uh, really what happened was um, I had pitched I had pitched an Olaf origin story called Once Upon a Snowman. And um, and I come from the animation department, so I happen to be supervising uh, Olaf from Frozen 2. And Dan was working in story on Frozen 2, and Dan was uh, storyboarding some of the some of the best uh, Olaf sequences. And 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 when I pitched this short, uh, Jen Greenlit, Jennifer Lee, our uh, chief creative officer, and she said, "Why don't you team up with Dan to work on this?" So Dan and I worked on this short called Once Upon a Snowman, and we finished the short having such a great time making it like we you know so all of this stuff can be hard and challenging and and everyone puts a ton of work into it but we we finished the short and just said that was a great time like we we had such a good time working together and just wanted to do it again and so we both went our separate ways you know i i went to go work on the zootopia plus series and dan went to go work on the baymax series and we we kind of had this breakup and we're like how do we get back together again how do we how do we work together again and that's where uh, the very spark of this idea came from. Nice. Yeah. So we we realized um, this was two years ago that we were we started having this conversation about let's try to direct something together again. Uh, and it's it's always a bit of a weird thing when you know no one is asking you to do that when you sort of just just start <laughs> doing it doing it on your own. Um, you know, because it's like, who's who's going to buy this thing that we're selling that no one is looking to buy sort of <laughs> idea. But uh, uh, two years ago, uh, this was during COVID. COVID had just started sort of thing. And uh, Trent and I were trying to think of a project to to work on together. And we very quickly came up with, well, hey, man, the 100 year anniversary of Disney animation is coming up. How cool is it that we're going to be working at the studio at that time? Why don't we put something together that really celebrates that milestone? And so because it was the early days of COVID and you couldn't get anywhere near each other or any of that stuff, yeah. like we would zoom back and forth and talk about this, this project and then we would miss each other. So we would go to a, a fast food restaurant, uh, drive through, and we would in our separate cars and we would have our supper and we would roll down the windows and stay six feet apart and talk about what this could be. And we really wanted to put something together that celebrated the, the history of Disney animation, of all the artists that came through the building over the years, all the characters. Like, how do you how do you encompass all of that uh, in like in a short? So we just started talking about, well, what would we want to see, you know, because we're big Disney fans and nerds. And um, and so we just started coming up with ideas. Trent had the great idea of um, having the characters jump out of the the pictures on the walls of the, uh, they're at the studio. Cause we both really, we talked about how we loved old interviews and stuff where anytime anybody was talking to an animator, they'll kind of look at what's on their desk or, you know, what, what, what are like the this, pictures right here? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah in yeah, this I, case, what's behind him? <laughs> yeah. And, and you have to remember, too, at this time, Dan and I meeting, I mean, this was over an eight-month period. We were working, you know, Saturdays, Sundays, lunch hours, coming up with this idea. And you have to remember, nobody was asking for this. So we we joke with each other all the time, like, is this a huge waste of time? Like, nobody's asking us to do this, and we're just drawing cartoons and having fun. And like Dan mentioned, we truly were just making the short we'd want to see for the Disney 100 
without anyone saying to do this thing. So yeah. we knew that leading up to this pitch, when we emailed Jennifer Lee, that like she could just say no, we have other stuff planned, or or this isn't the right fit. And and so we emailed Jen, and and Dan pitched away. Well, there was you you know all the planets sort of have to align because we had to pitch it to her when it was the right time. Like if we would have pitched it months later or months prior, it might not have happened. We might not, not have had the manpower. We might not. I mean, there could be a hundred reasons, but, and we didn't know when the best time was. So we just, it was like shooting in the dark. And um, after those eight months, when we got in front of her and said, Hey, we want, we want to pitch you something. And she was very confused by that. Um, but she's like, okay. And over zoom still, cause it was COVID I pitched through all the storyboards and did all the voices and had to sing at the end and the whole shebang. And, and, uh, and then at the end she said, I, I don't know how, but we have to figure out how to make this. So, uh, it was, uh, it was amazing. Her reaction. She said, you know, people have been wanting us at, at the studio to, uh, do something with all of the characters together. For a long time, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the fans have been wanting that. But she goes, it it just never made sense why Ariel and Stitch would be in the same room. Like he's they're they're part of different world. I mean, all these different characters. How could you do that? But she said because it was within the studio walls and that that it that made sense to her. And and we're like, oh, go oh, good. We didn't realize that that was even a thing. Um, but we, we were so happy that she took to it. Yeah. Um, well, I'll say what my, yeah. one of my questions is, which is I've never taken a tour of the studio or been on that side of uh, the United States. So my question is, how many of those paintings that are the inspiration for the characters within the short are in the studio? Are they all in there? That's a it's a really good question. And, and you got to come out and see the studio one day. Uh, you got to make it. To I do. Store. I want to. <laughs> yeah, let us know when you come by the. Um, you know, one one thing I'll say before answering that is it was very important to Dan and I in those early pitch days when we were meeting at an undisclosed fast food restaurant uh, that we wanted to give people a peek behind the curtain of the studio because we both grew up on watching behind the scenes, uh, VHS extras, you know, the, the, the peek behind the curtain of how these movies were made, but also just the studio space. I, I'm fascinated by that stuff. So the whole idea was to bring the audience into our studio and in terms of the paintings on the walls, we worked with the ARL, with, which is our animation research library, to set dress uh, the studio walls. But the studio is naturally covered in our beautiful artwork everywhere. Yeah, we had to we had to do some set dressing because you know story wise, if you saw pictures on the walls and they had characters in it you know, it was established that those characters were going to jump out. And there were certain scenes where we didn't want characters to come out of artwork, but we still wanted artwork on the walls. So uh, we had a lot of thinking to do in order to like make sure that, okay, well, this one where, you know, Bambi, Thumper, and Flower come out, that's great. But then like in the background, there's like a picture of the castle, um, no characters in it. Because if there was a character, then you'd be like, oh, so-and-so is going to come to life. And if they didn't, then you'd be confused. And so there was there was a lot of sort of moving things around and and making it so that it best supported the story we were telling. And also, you know, if, if you had Sisu flying down the hallway, if she flew off screen and then you saw Sisu in a painting down the end of the hallway, that would break the logic. So we were talking about all these all these cartoon logic things we had to to figure out the math for. So now, out of curiosity, how much of that was all in camera? How much of it was added in post? I'm sure all the characters, obviously, but like how much of the paintings were physically in camera and how much of them were animated in post? Um, I'm going to say 99% were set dress. And we did, in a few cases, have to um, put in digital pictures in the wall. But I'd say most of it was in the set dressing, Dan. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think more, probably more than 99%, but uh, uh, percentage wise, I'm, I, gosh, I'd have to really think about it. Like, cause there's, yeah, a lot of it was practical, but then there were cases that some of it was digital, depending on what shot we were doing. Um, And of course, uh, every character from the animated canon is in this, including New Groove. Obviously, I would want to talk about that. Uh, but in particular, Cusco himself actually has a line in the short where he interacts with Oswald. 
Uh, where did the idea for that interaction come from? Well, I, I, I'll let Dan talk to that, but one quick thing to note is it's not every character from the Disney canon in here. We do represent every Sorry, character. Not every, not every character. Character from every movie in short. Yes, there is successfully a character, at least at least one character from every feature and some shorts. Um, but yeah, we were happy to have uh, Cusco back in, in llama form. Yeah, we um, that you know it was a constant shifting puzzle because when we got the green light to do this, we Trent and I let it blow up to about twelve minutes, and so we threw every single idea we had into it, knowing we were going to have to then cut it down to about eight and a half. And we knew that that was going to be tricky, but we hoped that like that sort of the best gags and the the best moments sort of bubbled to the top and and stayed in the film. Because um, at one point, uh, Mickey s encountered Oswald inside uh, before. Clarabelle and Ka came through. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, "After you, as as Oswald." Yeah. And then, just as story does, it moves. Things need to be tightened, and the flow of things, and this and that, and the other. So, at, at, because he did that earlier inside, Cusco actually said no touchy to Rafiki, who came through the crowd with the camera. Uh, uh, yeah. So at one point, it was. Cusco saying that to Rafiki, but then because of the big shift and everything, we thought, oh, it's nice to have Oswald show up in that moment, and things got shifted around. So it worked out pretty good that he kind of comes in, Mickey says, after you, and then uh, uh, he bumps into Cusco. And we were we were so excited to, well, I, I love me some David Spade, so using that clip was really fun, but also... We, if you don't know, we had Nick Ranieri, the original animator. Yeah, he was, we actually in interviewed him. Uh, we actually watched uh, oh, cool. it on ABC. We, we watched the uh, premiere of it with them. Oh, how, so that was on this podcast. We heard that he watched it live on a podcast. We weren't sure where. How cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were we were so excited to bring back Nick Ranieri. He's animated so many great characters over the years. And he he actually did Oswald and, uh, and Cusco in that shot. Yeah. yeah. Um, one question, there's a couple questions that some things my friend, some of my friends were curious about. Uh, one friend wants to know, did John C. Riley improvise the bit where Ralph calls Mickey Garfield? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, I guess the short answer is no. Um, when, when Trent and I were coming up with what's a funny line for, for Ralph after he clocks himself with the glass door, um, you know, first we wrote, you know, cause he's talking to Mickey Mouse and at yeah. first we thought he could say, uh, oh, never better Minnie. We're like, oh, that's funny. He, he thinks, you know, and, or, oh, never better Donald. Never, never better Pluto. Oh, okay. That's funny. Cause it's, it's, uh, Pluto doesn't even talk, but then Trent knew that as a, as a kid, I was a big Garfield fanatic. And so there was a pause there as we were both thinking. And then Trent just turns to me and says, never better Garfield. <laughs> and I just sort of lost it and couldn't stop. Like I was crying. I was laughing so hard. And and uh, it it was a very, very funny moment. And it felt very Ralph. It felt very Ralph. This was, uh, you know, in the story room, we're often just trying to make each other laugh and come up with ideas and, you know, kind of one up each other in a fun way of like, oh, what if they did this? And I've, I've personally never seen Dan Abraham break more than that moment in the story <laughs> room. We had to give him like a 30 second break to recover from uh, yeah. a better Garfield. It tickled my funny bone. That's for sure. <laughs> On the subject of making each other laugh, did you guys have, like, sticky notes that you would just, like, lean over and be like, oh, that's a good one? Or did you have, like, an Apple Notes app pulled up to write, oh, yeah, these are the jokes that I think would work to go over with each other? Or did some of them just come organically? You know, we a lot of times we would um, storyboard, because a lot of these moments are really short. And so you could sort of tell your gag within six or eight panels or something like that. And so we would... Uh, uh, a lot of times during the COVID times when we were separated and all that, we would quickly storyboard out the moment and then record it with our phone and pitch it to each other and then send it, text it to each other to see what the other person's uh, input would be. That I think we did that more than probably anything else. Yeah, for example, Dan, we had, we had this shot where Ariel was doing her hair with the dinglehopper. 
and then the the fork turns into morph from treasure planet so there's like trying to find these little moments uh that could fit in the story um and and like dan said we kind of ballooned it up but slowly had to chop it down and had to leave some things on the cutting room floor which uh hopefully you just hope the kind of best stuff rises to the top um i saw an instagram post i mean i saw your all's instagram post one of your instagram posts about uh, i think it was dan uh about the yzma flirting with hercules gag and uh, yeah. what, what were some other jokes you liked you re really liked that didn't make the cut um let's see we swapped out a lot of uh, yeah, I'll throw one out there. We swapped out a lot of, you know, just for time's sakes, like we mentioned, swapped out a lot of jokes. We had, this is actually in the short, it's Louisa holding a bunch of quadrupeds, some from yeah. Home on the Range. She's in the crowd, but we did have a reoccurring joke at some point where she was, you know, we cut to some cubicles and Rudd and Tuke were there from uh, from uh, Brother Bear and she'd come pick them up. I think we had two or three little jokes where she was slowly making the pile and we yeah. we kind of... We ended on only having the sloth gag kind of be the reoccurring thing uh, yeah. and, and let that be for the elevator. But we still got to have Luisa outside with all the quadrupeds up there, which I think just in that single image really uh, sells the joke anyways. Yeah, there was a, you know, there was a moment. I don't know if it was a, a gag as much as just a moment, but it was uh, it was very, very cute where when Pinocchio was going to come out of his frame um uh, he re like he looked down and he's like, "Boy, that's a long way down." And he looks at Figaro like, "How are we gonna get down there?" And then this long cascading bunch of blonde hair goes past him, and he looks up, and uh, 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 Rapunzel is uh, you know sticking out of the frame above him, and she kind of gives him a little wink, and so he slides down Rapunzel's hair to get to the ground, and then uh, uh, Figaro is about to do the same thing, but all of a sudden um, Pascal comes down the hair and scares Figaro and Figaro falls back into, into his frame. It was just a cute little moment that uh, would have been fun. But again, it was, time. it was hard. It was hard to cut some of these. Cause we, I mean, they, we, we just had so much fun coming up with them. And for the, the Louisa example with Rudd and Tuke, I remember I really wanted to meet Rick Moranis selfishly. I'm like, if we can get him in, I'm Canadian. He's a Canadian hero. <laughs> like how cool would it be to have him? But you know, we had to cut stuff for story six. Jacob, do you have any questions? Well, something else I was curious about, because I know this is, it's all different branches and such. I'd be very curious to know, will there be any plans to do other things like this with other parts of Disney animation or even just other parts of Disney? Hmm. There has been zero discussions about any of that. <laughs> Cause yeah, I'd, be, I'd love to see this get done for TV animation Maybe even for live action. Well, though, all be, those AI are all territory. That'd, that'd all, of course, be up to different divisions and stuff. Yeah, I was about to say since you guys came up with this idea organ like yourselves, it would, I guess, have to be somebody in TV animation pitching something similar. But I guess yeah, this, or that's kind of parks. what the TV shorts have been doing, something similar to that, where it's just interactions between the TV the TV shorts, yeah. Yeah, and our, our kind of rule of thumb going into this was that um, that we just wanted to celebrate Disney feature animation and, and yeah. stuff that been done here. So we really stuck to our, our features, um, you know, everything from Snow White leading up to Wish and then um, and then the shorts, obviously. But hey, who knows? In a, in a When companies turn 100 or 200, maybe they'll be inspired to to make a short of their own. And, it, you know, for for the, the story that we were trying to tell, it wouldn't have made sense to have Pixar characters. It wouldn't no. have made sense to have, because it was our studio. So for them to come out of the frames on, we, like, we don't have no. Pixar characters up in our studio. We no, I think, I think, sorry. I think what Jacob meant is uh, just he thinks it would be cool if the other studios had got had similar things. But I know that that wouldn't be up to you all. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know who would spearhead that. Who knows? Who who knows who the next? Uh... Who knows if somebody's not doing it right now? It could True. be. It could be. I know you said that um, the one line that we suspected might have been improv was not improv. Uh, it was scripted. Was there anything from the recording sessions that made it in? You know, I, th I think. Like I, yeah, I think uh, you know all, all the actors kind of brought 
broad stuff too but for the most part it was i'd say i gotta throw it 99 scripted again uh with with the exception the one off the top of my mind is josh gad yeah. um you know when when he's sitting at the desk and and timon and puma walk by and he says it's all in the wrist that was josh gad um fully and he played he played with a lot of fun ideas in there too and he's humming friend like me at the desk there's there's a lot of josh gad in there yeah we we had you know we had written some lines for olaf but we said josh do your thing like you're he knows that character better than anyone and boy he delivered like his line was way better than i don't even remember what we had but um oh uh our line was olaf said you can't rush art when when yeah. Timon says come on let's go and he's like you can't rush art but uh josh's line was way better yeah yeah um now i have to remember what i was gonna ask <laughs> I know some of the recordings were obviously archival things, things like Bobby yeah. Driscoll, etc. Were there anyone that was either non-archival and not uh, like, were there any sound alikes in there? Or was it all just either archival or you got the real person? I'll be quiet. <laughs> oh yeah, there's there was um, there was uh, a handful of sound alikes because you know um, Ed Wynn uh, is the Mad Hatter. He's he passed on quite a while ago and. And um, the the little boy who played Thumper is no longer a little boy. He's a, a ninety year old uh, man. So we had to um, uh, we brought in Alan Tudyk for, to be our our Mad Hatter, and we got a little boy um, to. We wanted to use some archival footage of uh, Thumper's audio, his little giggle, and his wake up, wake up. Um, it was just it's so perfect and iconic but we needed to add to it. So we had a little boy come in and do an additional line, the, okay, here we come. And uh, that was really, really fun to uh, see if we could mix the two and make it sound like one kid, which I think it did. It, it, yeah. it, it sounded really good. But we also had, um, uh, you know, uh, Jim Cummings is not the original Baloo. He's not the original Winnie the Pooh, but man, he does a great job of, of getting us there. And so we used both Sterling Holloway and... Jim Cummings for our two Winnie the Pooh moments. And um, and then he luckily he was able to step in and be our Baloo for us since Phil Harris has passed. But um, yeah, we had a, a few few sound alikes where we needed. And we were so particular. Like we tried so hard to get exactly like, you, you only get a few seconds with these characters, right? And so we wanted them to not only look, but sound exactly like you remember so that yeah. it, it you know, it took you right back to that nostalgic place of the first time you saw them. And it was it was fun to hear them in the recording booth, like the voice of Snow White and, and Cinderella, and they just sound remarkably like the originals. Also, a little side fact, we, in I think October last year, uh, the three gentlemen that played Bambi, Thumper, and Flower came by the studio, and they're, they're all late 80s, early 90s, right, Dan? And we got to show them the short, but they're, they all came in person to the studio. Oh, nice. That was so, so cool. Special. It was yeah. very special. I got them to sign my Art of Bambi book. I was like just geeking out. Like to me, they're the Beatles, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That's funny. Hmm. I say, Micah, did you remember your question? No. <laughs> I was too, <laughs> I was too caught up in listening to everything. <laughs> To the Bambi Beatles, yeah, <laughs> the Bambi Beatles. Bam Beatles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was it was? I, I'll just say as you're thinking about your question, the it was just so great to have every original voice cast we reach out to. We have 40 plus in this short said yes enthusiastically and wanted to come back to work on this. And it was it was such a joy recording these people. They they just shared. You know, we'd bring them in, and some of them only have you know a couple words or or a line. And we'd bring them in and, and we'd show them the short in the first half hour or hour of having them at the studio would just be talking about them sharing kind of what these characters meant to them over the years. Uh, we had Richard White talk about like going to children's hospitals and playing Gaston and what a gift that's been for him. And that was maybe a little unexpected for us because we we think of like these characters as kind of a, a gift that that we get to be a part of and work on but to hear from the voice actor side and and that they remember you know nick ranieri 
uh, uh, talking about um, and James Woods talking about the how the how art and voice actors work together and and their their love of working on movies like uh, like Hercules is is very special. Yeah, it was it was emotional. Um, they they got emotional talking about their character and what that of being that character what that effect had on their lives and um it was really really cool very very special one thing this isn't a question this is just something i want to bring up um i a lot of people have talked about this i noticed uh robin from back to neverland the show that was uh used to be at mgm studios appears uh, in there and i actually i don't i'm don't want to say I was the last person there because I'm sure there were people who went there after me, but I was like among the last several people. Like I went in 2003. That was like a year before the studios, the the Florida studio shut down. Um, so I remember seeing that uh, at MGM Studios, and I thought that was really neat that he's in that, there. That actually is what I was about to bring up too. Um, I like that he popped up, hearkening the genie. Were there any other little cameos like that? That were so specific that you really are proud of getting in there. Well, that that one uh, I'll speak to Robin quickly first because we when 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 we pitched uh, to Jennifer Lee and then we pitched to the stu the whole studio as a whole a couple months later and Dan over Zoom pitched to you know a thousand people at our studio and he also sang on Zoom to a thousand people, <laughs> uh, which is great. I'm uh, not a singer, <laughs> but he sang it beautifully and uh, and we put word out to the studio and said let us know like like people were just emailing us and stopping us in the hall saying i want to be part of this thing and they had ideas so we sent out this google sheet and said let us know if you have ideas for the short if you want to see character interactions if you have characters that inspired you over the years if you have stories you want to tell us and so one of the animators michael woodside who's a good friend of ours he he shared his story uh that growing up in florida and orlando that he used to go to his mom would drop him off at the studio and he'd sit and watch animators work uh, through the fishbowl, and and he'd watch that video with Robin coming to life, the Walter Cronkite video. And so he said, "I'd love to get Robin in there." And our kind of rule of thumb was these characters needed to come from Disney Animation, which Robin was animated by Disney animators. And so uh, Michael sent us in a drawing of Robin flying, and we squeezed him into that scene with the genie and Olaf sitting there. And when Eric Goldberg, our head of uh, hand-drawn animation, was casting the show he cast it to Michael so that Michael could also animate that character. And it was, it was just really, a really touching and, and a really cool story for Michael to share with us. And we're, we're so happy you got to animate that character. Yeah. He, he, he got emotional about it. He said, boy, if you would have told 10 year old Michael that the next time this character was going to be animated, it was going to be animated by him. And for the hundredth year of Disney animation, like he's, he gets, he gets a little salty about it. Cause it, it that he said, that's the character that made him want to be an animator. That like that had such a profound effect on his life and his career, and is why he is where he is today. And so to get to to get him in this short was like it was a no brainer. And uh, and yeah, he's he doesn't have a lot of screen time, but he's there. We didn't forget, you know. We didn't yeah. we didn't actually forget anybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A lot of times I'm reading online different people saying you forgot so and so and you forgot so and so and I'm like no we did not actually we're big nerds and we uh, have an extensive Disney knowledge library Rolodex in our heads but we just we couldn't get every single Disney character in there and and actually complete the film like we wish there were hundreds and hundreds more I mean Lampwick's not in there Horace and Jasper there's countless there's countless characters that aren't there but uh, we got. Trust us, we got as many as we possibly could. At one point, our producers were like, you have to stop adding characters. <laughs> but then Trent would jump in and do animation so that we could add more characters. He was doing hand-drawn animation in there. And I went back to the cleanup table after 20 years, and I was doing cleanup. It was all hands on deck. We really it was, it was a very, very scrappy operation in a way because we Trent was doing uh, effects, doing the sparkles on Tiana's dress and Cinderella's dress and different things, trying to figure out how that worked. And Honestly, yeah. it came from pure desperation. Anytime they said, well, we got to, we got to lose this character. We're like, no, 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 we can, we can help. We can jump in there and, and help out. So it was, it was a fun way to, to get our hands in there. And, and I'll add to Shelby, one of the characters that jumps to my mind, that's like a, a really small cameo Easter egg, but 
when Merlin's in the, you know, at the coffee patch, he's got the little sugar bowl beside him that looks up. In, in Sword in the Stone, that's just one of my favorite sequences ever uh, inside his little hut as he's packing the bags. So really happy to get that in there, animated by one of our 2D apprentices, uh, Courtney. And um, and he, also in that scene, if you don't know, is, is and Dan, I'm blanking on her name from... Lucille Conkelhorn? <laughs> Lucille, Lucille Conkelhorn. I'm yes. good yes. friends with Steven Anderson, so he he was very oh. happy about that. And 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 I I don't know if you all know the story, but she wears she wears a caffeine patch in the movie, uh, obviously, and and that area in our studio is called the caffeine patch, and it was it was built and named after that. So that's that's why she's in that. And you know, for anything uh, pre tangled, we had to remodel and rebuild characters, re rig them, retexture them. So. You know, us asking for Lucille, someone had to put in a lot of work to make sure we could have her for those, you know, four seconds on screen. Yeah. But yeah, they're at, at Disney Animation. Like if, you know, you're texting with a friend or whatever and you say, I'll meet you in the patch. That's the <laughs> caffeine patch. And that's named after Lucille Crunklehorn's caffeine patch on her arm. So, yeah. It's it's that's a that's a pretty deep dive that most people probably aren't going to catch. Like that's the reason that she's there, but that was a nice little a little wink to not only Steve Anderson, uh, who I adore, but um, everybody that worked on that movie and everybody that's at the building. Hey, Dan, there, there's another Steve Anderson nod, right? On the staircase? Well, yeah, he's a uh, bowler hat guy. He's the he's voice, the voice of bowler of, hat guy. He's, he's in the credits and the voice acting credits. Yep. Just his little do or whatever it was. That's Steve. And, of course, Kronk is also in that shot. Mm -hmm. yep. On the stairs. I don't remember. I I mostly just remember Bowler Hat Guy and Kong from that soft job, but there's other characters there. Oh yeah, yeah it's loaded. Yeah. That was what it was like. How do you how do you show that the lobby is full uh in the best way possible without actually drawing 200 characters in that shot sort of thing? And because it was yeah. it it was tricky. We had to we had to do a lot of tricks. Yeah. And remember, Dan, how so one of the animators, Hyun Min Lee, she worked on that shot on the staircase with Tony DeRosa working on Dumbo and Mickey flying. Uh, but she was drawing, you know, so small. She, we, oh, she yeah. showed some of her sketches and they were just like so detailed and so beautiful. And they're all, you know, they're ducking or looking at Dumbo. They're so beautiful. Her little uh, Skippy and Toby from uh, Robin Hood, she drew them like they're so tiny, but the detail in them is incredible. I wonder what number pencil she used to get in there, but oh, the most adorable. She's a, she's a genius, that that girl. And I think like it's a good example actually of I, I think when when we were issuing that shot with her, we're like we can keep it really simple. They can kind of stay still and just watch Dumbo. But she added all this personality of them ducking. You know, they yeah, get their... totally tucks his head inside his tortoise shell. You know, yeah, it's so fun to like. That's what kind of it's the beauty of working at Disney. Everyone kind of brings and it brings their a game and, and also makes everything better from story layout lighting animation tech anim and uh and it's pretty cool to see all the detail um you know the hair flying by as dumbo uh swoops down yeah i've i've never been so inspired in my whole life uh working on this short with these people like they were so dedicated to quote unquote get it right and to you know bring these these friends back to the audiences um because you know disney fans have ownership of these characters they love them they relate to them um for a lot of us we see these movies when we're little and you know it's our first introduction into what is love what is bravery we experience death a lot of times for the first time through these films different things so i think it goes back to a lot of those core memories and everybody on the crew just inherently knows all that and wanted to do the characters justice um, for the fans and for all the, the artists that created them. Like it was, we would talk about it daily and, and to see these, these, you know, rough animation tests, Eric Goldberg doing the Mad Hatter and, and different things and seeing it for the first time. And Trent would, and I would look at each other and be like, I can't believe we're doing this. I can't believe it. Like there's the Mad Hatter looking as good as he ever did like it just oh it was it was joyous from start to finish it was really amazing um 
we were surprised when we got the the green light that we were going to make this and we Trent and I kind of looked at each other like okay now now here's where everybody's going to dog pile in with all of their notes and tell us well make sure Cinderella's wearing this or make sure Mickey's wearing that and that so and so has this amount of screen time and different things and that just didn't happen like we I guess they saw our our initial pitch and kind of trusted us. I mean, we got we got notes along the way for sure. Jen Lee gave us some great notes, a lot of, a lot of stuff about tightening and and pacing and that sort of a thing. But they never they never much to our surprise, never came in and mandated that so and so needed to be wearing whatever it was and none of that. Like it they really did leave it up to Trent and I to to sort of get our vision on the screen it was really it, it was kind of it, it was kind of shocking because you yeah like dan said you think about this hundred year short and, and the pressure of that but just i honestly it just felt like a scrappy student film in a way it felt like a passion project and all of our friends coming to work on it and everybody being so excited to work on it you think disney and this this you know obviously we had a lot of resources but it just felt like this very scrappy film that people wanted to be part of and that 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 we were all just all hands on deck uh anytime you know to do ink and paint or clean up or effects all that stuff yeah it you know we wanted we wanted the fans to enjoy it but i think it's almost like there's no bigger disney fans than the people that are working in that building yeah. like they're so passionate about their favorite characters and their favorite films and all of that that it, it was so much fun it was so much fun to all be on that same wavelength and just like marching forward and you know uh, animators would come to dailies even if they didn't have uh anything to show just because they wanted to see other people's stuff and the same with the effects animators and all of that like everybody just wanted to see everybody's stuff and and yeah we would get stopped constantly by people in the hall saying I have to work on this. I have to be part of this, and and how just 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 touching and and lovely. It, it also, was... who doesn't want to be in a room with Eric Goldberg, Mark Henn, and James Baxter? Right? It's like sign yeah. me up. That's every. Oh. If you, if you told student us or or even working us, that was a possibility. <laughs> We'd pinch ourselves. Yeah. Oh. What else? Yeah, we, we we did think for a minute there that um you know because of the outfit that we put mickey in um we thought well they're gonna come at us and tell us he needs to be in his red shorts you know and they didn't um and i'm so glad we we had thought of that outfit and that stemmed from the walt and mickey moment that we knew we wanted to have in there um and i thought wouldn't it be a really nice visual for mickey to be able to remove his hat and then I'm like, okay, well, Mickey's birthday party, uh, he's got that really cute little yellow hat and the blue shirt and everything. Why don't we go with that, Mickey? Um, and uh, and, and the then birthday somebody... of the studio. Yeah. You know, somebody somebody online said that. They're like, oh, well, the reason they chose that outfit was because it's for Mickey's birthday party and it's the birthday of the studio. And I went, hey, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, the, isn't that just the way it always is? People, you, you, you think of something, but you, but like you come up with an idea and someone points out something about that you didn't even realize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, I yeah. You just accept like that as the point, version. Right? <laughs> yeah, someone else pointed out online, I think with the fly-through shot, they were like, I'm going to make up details, but they're like, oh, you chose Jim Hawking because the voice actor of that was in a sitcom with this character, and they were born in the same hospital, and they're both from the same town, and their mothers know <laughs> each other, yeah. and that's why you chose Maui. To, and I was like, nope, we just thought it would okay, look cool. Exactly. <laughs> I I love the way people's brains do the Charlie Day on the corkboard thing. It's oh beautiful. yeah, oh yeah, it's all coming together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm a I'm a big Disney fan, and sometimes I'm reading that stuff, and I'm like, boy, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're saying or no. Um, well, now, because I know you've mentioned, you know, everybody wanted to animate on their favorite characters. So for the two of you guys. Who are your favorite animated Disney characters from obviously from Disney animation? <laughs> I'm I'm gonna go with the genie. And uh, you know, is, Aladdin came out at the perfect time when I was a kid. And and I think seeing 
Robin Williams and the voice and the artistry and Eric Goldberg animate the genie. And then to have, you know, I very clearly remember Eric showing his first pass of the genie in animation dailies. And it's like, holy smokes, you know, here's the original animator of the genie um, animating the genie again. It's perfect. You just let Eric do his thing. Uh, and then his wife, Susan, you know, cleaned up uh, the genie too. So it's just, and she got the beautiful thick and thin lines from, uh, from the movie that kind of Al Hirsch felt inspired uh, ink lines. So just, uh, it was so cool seeing, well, first of all, working with Eric and being part of the short with him in this way, but seeing the genie come to life again from Eric's pencil is amazing. Yeah. Ugh. My my favorite character uh, has always been the Tramp from Lady and the Tramp. Uh, my mom took me to see a reissue of that movie when I was little and it just, it, 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 became part of my DNA. Like it became part of just the scene where the tramp wakes up when we first establish him and he's in his barrel and he in the train yard there and he like stretches and he goes and he takes a little shower under the dripping water and shakes it off. And now, now to rustle up some breakfast. Um, that's, that's my favorite scene in animation. And, and that's the scene that made me want to uh, be in animation and, and at Disney specifically. And um Tramp doesn't have a whole lot to do in Once Upon a Studio, uh, but he is there with Lady after Mowgli and Baloo sing their line. We cut to the magic harp from uh, Fun and Fancy Free with Sebastian conducting on top, and Lady and the Tramp are both there sort of nuzzling each other as the strings vibrate. And there was a, a moment where, you know, it was brought up that we could lose that for complexity like that's that's animating four more characters um and uh we were trying to get the thing done and i kind of like pushed for it just because uh, like i gotta get i gotta get lady and the tramp in there they mean so much to me so we could have held on Mowgli and baloo a little longer but um i'm really glad that we got to keep uh and i love fun and fancy free and we hadn't had a, we didn't have a place for sebastian that was the whole thing every time we would lose a moment and you know in our 12 minute version uh I'd be like oh crap we lost aladdin or we lost so and so or we lost this one or that one so we had to keep constantly shifting them around that's why you'll rarely see the characters more than once throughout because yeah. there's so many that we wanted to, to at least see them you know once uh, uh yeah in there and then the, the, the last shot about... where they're all and the neat thing about that Lady in the Tramp shot is um, is one of our 2D apprentices, Tyler Pacana. He he, uh, you know, we we had this apprentice program where they brought in five 2D hand drawn apprentices uh, and trained them for six months. And then uh, this was their Once Upon a Studio was their first production ever. They, so all of a sudden they are in a training program, and then we're like, hey, animate a hundred Disney characters and work under Eric Goldberg, and. Um, so Tyler animated that whole shot, the the harp, um, Sebastian and Lady and the Tramp. Wow. Yeah, you did a great job. Yeah. He saved he saved the tramp for Dan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I know you have talked about watching the dailies and how amazing that was to see everything like as it's coming in. How was it seeing one, everything all together, like up on the screen for the first time and how was seeing the reaction like have were you able to see anybody's like personal reaction to this work that you put together yeah <laughs> yeah uh i'm trying to think which one was my my favorite reaction i i think you know the first time we showed it i'll speak to this one first is is um at annecy is where we had its uh international premiere in annecy france at the animation festival and um yeah, it was, it was beyond, I, I mean, the, the, you just, I, I guess for everything we work on at the studio over the years, Dan and I have been working in animation a little while and you work on, we always say this, you work on a project, whether it turns out great or not so great or conflicting views on it, you work just as hard on every project and you pour everything into it and you work overtime and it's all you talk about and you live and breathe this stuff. And especially when you're in the story room, you just hope like, I, I hope that Garfield line that made Dan laugh will make the audience laugh. And yeah. the, the feeling when you get on stage and we presented this to the crowd in Annecy of their reaction, I mean, half of me is like, thank goodness, 
you know, it it the, the our pitch and our nostalgia and the love of animation came across. Um, but also, you can't help but think about all the hard work. You know, it, we had, we had we had so many people work on this show and and put in overtime and pour their hearts into it. And when you're up there and people are are clapping and reacting to it, that's what goes through your head is is how much passion everyone poured into this project. Absolutely. It was, it was really, really great. Um, um, the reactions and, and, you know, we had earlier on, like we have to periodically show like executives throughout the company, uh, rough cuts and different things. And we bring them into the studio and Trent and I do a little spiel about how we came up with the idea and all those types of things. And then we show it to them and, and they all, kept responding so well that even then even though they some of them teared up these executives and different things and and that was that was a good sign but that doesn't necessarily translate to you know mass audiences around the world and stuff so you just you never know until you get it out there but it's been so lovely the reactions that that people have had it's been really really nice and it it makes us feel good because we did want to represent their characters in in the way that they remembered them and and in the best way possible and, and all that so it, it it felt like okay phew, okay they seem to think that we did it right so that's that's what we're trying to do does anyone else have any questions i was wondering now with... so well well, I was curious with how much um, 2D animation has showed up in this specific short. Do we think we might see another full 2D animated project at some point, like hand animation project again at some point? Mm. Well, you know what this this project called for it. We in in the something we didn't talk about at the beginning was in this original pitch to Jennifer Lee. Um, we had a little kind of Google slide at the beginning and said we want. Uh, you know the hand-drawn stuff to be on paper with pencil and because the characters should look and feel just as they did we don't want to do anything digital to cheat it we don't want to build them in cg we want this to look and feel just the same and our cg characters to look and feel the same so for this project in particular it was no question jennifer lee she didn't bat an eyelid she said of course it has to be hand-drawn and, and we and the team got to work and the producers came on and our 2d team uh hand-drawn team came together to make that happen um, so it, it was project specific and, you know, if there's other projects in the future that, that have that same goal, I, I think that's the case. But, uh, for us specifically, it was, it was all in the original pitch. I would love it. <laughs> I think, I think many, many of us would. <laughs> there's really nothing quite like seeing those like human strokes, like, there's amazing things that can be done with a computer, but there's just something so special about hand-drawn animation. Yeah. Yep. That, that uh, It's so fun to see the rough animation, too. I, I think that's one of my biggest memories from the short is seeing people show their first pass when you can really see the, the, the them working out the acting and, and the hand-drawn element and, and the appreciation for that, like how hard it is. You know, when we saw Randy Haycock's Gaston like there's that's not an easy character to draw and all his big muscles and 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 chiseled face and and yeah. it is a when you look at those original drawings they're just incredible and that the fluidity that he got on Aladdin as he flies through the air this is Randy Haycock as well and then he lands on the troll boulders and his arms go flailing back and all that stuff we just I don't know how many times we watch that over and over and over in rough form we're just like geeking out we're like Randy and we're like patting him on the back it's, it's Aladdin it's Aladdin this is incredible this isn't it just oh yeah it lit us up you know, a fun thing to talk about too, just speaking about the two mediums is um, we had a few animators do both where they, they're they trained hand-drawn animators and they've transitioned to CG or, they, or they've or they juggled both. And um, Bert Klein, you know, he started here, I think during Lion King uh, as an 18 year old, you know, fresh out of high school, he, he came to Disney. And uh, so he's trained in hand-drawn and he switched over to CG and he's just such a great animator, but he would often take scenes uh, that involve both and and in some cases utilize both those talents right he, he's incredible at cg and and has the hand-drawn skill too so in um 
he did a scene of Mirabelle and Scat Cat playing the trumpet. And uh, he actually he actually shrunk down he shrunk down a Clawhauser model from Zootopia to like get the basics because uh, Mirabelle and Scat Cat needed to touch shoulders. So yeah. he, he locked it in loosely with with Clawhauser just so he'd see the form and where they would touch because that would actually go down the pipeline to our hair and cloth team to inform a Mirabelle where her um, shoulder um, cloth would get compressed. So yeah. he would do that first and then he would draw over, um, use those rough poses and draw over with scat cats. So I, I just think there's such a strength to both mediums and it's really cool to see him and Mario from Anchek did Moana and Flounder and all that interaction. So there's a few people that juggled both, which was really inspiring. Yeah, that that um, Mirabelle scat cat shot. Bert Klein did every character, 2D and CG, in that shot, and which is really cool. And he did Stromboli in the vending machine as well. Mm, Stromboli, mommy. That's a that's a great example because he had to animate the vending machine in CG uh, to match his 2D. So he was able to work back and forth with himself in that case. Really. Right. That- I love yeah. the innovation of using Clawhauser <laughs> for, for like the mock-up in the CG. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it was really maybe surprising to us to see in dailies the first time, but it was a really clever trick to, to yeah. help our teams down the down the pipeline. A, a squished up little Clawhauser is basically the same proportions as Scat Cat, as it turns out. So. <laughs> I gotta say, it was really cute too. It was really the yeah. squished yeah. Clawhauser works. It works. We should- we should re- we got to release that footage uh, for a deleted <laughs> thing. That would be it's it's very very cute. And he even Honestly. used um, for the elephant. He used one of the elephants from our um, one of our yeah, shorts we did. Yeah, there's a short called there's a short circuit on Disney Plus called Elephant in the Room, um, and uh, by Brian Scott. And he used the the rig of the elephant in there to just you know act as a as kind of an apple box for a uh, scat cat. To, for placement. Hathi Jr. Yeah. I would love to see a once upon a once upon a studio and just see some of the back, <laughs> like some of the things that got cut that you like your little gifs that you essentially made of your scenes that didn't make it in and like some of the rough footage. That would be so cool to see. Like would just enhance the already incredible experience. Well, if you can't tell, we could talk about this for about eight hours. So, uh, yeah. so we'll, we'll work on it. <laughs> Release the Dan and Trent cut. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Um, it is now here. It is now 7.26 p.m. So we have about... Three minutes or so left. If you all want to say any final words or anything, uh, just thank geez. you so much for delivering this incredible gift to us. Yeah, like mm-hmm. thank you. Oh, oh gosh. it making this thing has been the highlight of my career. Uh, to get to work with the people that we got to meet, you know, that initial pitch to Jennifer Lee and saying that we wanted to bring back these these animators, these heavy hitter animators to revisit their characters, you know, they're, they're our heroes. They're Trent and I's heroes. And we're like, we were being kind of selfish, but at the same time, we knew that would be the best overall approach to bring yeah. back these folks. And, uh, and then 40 of the over 40 of the original voice talents. And then we got to work with Bernie Mattinson. And then we got to work with Richard Sherman, who did feed the birds for us from Mary Poppins. And it just, it, I could we couldn't have asked for more it and it was so much fun it was there was a lot to figure out there were three different pipelines going on in this and there were hundreds and hundreds of characters and all of that stuff but man oh man I I I truly hope that everyone can feel at some point in their lives as artistically fulfilled as this was for us like it there's probably not a huge percentage of people that will get to experience this and that makes me sad because it's it was really really special making it and it's and then the icing on the cake is that people seem to like it so uh it uh uh it's just unreal it was unreal yeah i I, i'd only second that by saying that this was truly a gift you mentioned gift it was a gift to us i mean it, it was it's if you asked dan and i 
you know, on, live on a podcast or in private or between meetings, we would make this short a thousand times over. It is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity to work with our heroes. And, and it didn't feel like work. I mean, Dan would, Dan would text me on Sundays and say, I can't wait for Monday. Nobody does that in their right yeah. mind. Nobody's that excited about work, but we were. <laughs> We'd get bumped out on Fridays. We had to go home for two days. It was, I mean, I've never had that experience in my life. Like everybody looks forward to the weekend, but on this project, man, we just wanted to keep going. It was just incredible. I kept a daily journal and just all the people I got to meet and, and work with and just did all the incredible um, experiences. It was just unreal. Yeah. That is amazing. Thank you all for, uh, and thanks to, if I may say so, thanks to, uh, Disney's senior, the senior vice president of PR, Amy Astley, for helping arrange this interview. Um, and thank you all for agreeing to uh, come on. Yay, Absolutely. thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. It was fun. Yes, it was. And yes, thank you, Amy. Amy was the supporter of this short from day one. We showed her very early on. So we're really happy to do this with you all. Yep. All right. <laughs>